So Walter Gropius is uh, one of the architects that came out of, uh, of uh, Peter Barron's office. Here he is uh, with his rendering of the Tribune Tower competition from 1922. Uh, this, this is a good, uh, shows you that he, he took that competition pretty seriously. This was a very serious, uh, thoughtful um, submission uh, and represented what he believed would be the future of architecture, and as it turns out, it ultimately would be. Here he is. Uh, so he had trained under Barons, and in 1919, struck out on his own, and he founds what is known as the Bauhaus, uh, which in German translated to English means building house. And this was more of a school, um, unlike the Deutsche Werkbund, which was more of a professional organization of like-minded professionals, the Bauhaus was intended to be an academy or a school to train emerging artists and designers and even architects in this new modernist architecture. And so uh, Gropius is, is really considered to be one of the main founders of the modernist movement because he founds the Bauhaus and out of the Bauhaus comes uh, any number of, of in influential designers and architects that um, that work in the in the international style and modernist style. Uh, it starts in Weimar, uh, uh, Germany, but in 1925, the authorities in Weimar, who are becoming more uh, conservative and radical, uh, kick them out essentially, and he moves the Bauhaus to Dessau and designs a new building, as we'll see in a few minutes. Uh, even that uh, doesn't last uh, past 1934. He, he steps down from the Bauhaus in the late 20s, uh, but in 1934, um, he leaves Germany altogether because of the pressure from the Nazis, the, the rising Nazi party. Hitler takes power in 1933 and, over all of Germany, and um, uh, this sort of modern architecture is considered to be degenerate by the Nazi authorities, and um, most of them, even if they weren't Jewish, uh, most of them soon leave uh, the country. Uh, uh, Gropius actually comes to America uh, and settles at Harvard University, becoming the director of architecture there. And so his influence on American architecture and the modernist movement in the United States is quite profound as well, uh, with Harvard being uh, the Graduate School of Design there being a, a major um, uh, university for architecture. So one of the projects I want to show by Gropius is uh, an early one. This is from 1911. So this is very early in his career. He's teamed up with Aldolf Meyer, and it's for a shoe factory, the Fagus Shoe Factory. Um, and this has a lot of similarities to his mentor, Peter Behrens, and the Turbine Factory from just a few years before that. Uh, it doesn't have the uh, sort of bowstring roof uh, form. It's a much smaller building as well. And he uses a lot more masonry instead of the pure steel along the side that Barron's used. But the front entrance way, get my clicker here, the front entrance way has definitely some of those same forms that the turbine factory does. It's brick masonry, it has the horizontal lines. He doesn't romanticize the brick uh, and sort of cant it and curve it. He creates a much more geometric squared off design here, but uh, you see that lasting influence. Uh, and then he has lots of window, steel window area, uh, and emphasizes the vertical piers in between as well, although the vertical piers are actually brick masonry instead of the expressed steel that we saw at the turbine factory. So there's definitely, you see that, that aesthetic connection and the influence carrying forth, but he's already starting to do some, some things that are a little bit different and things that are beginning to move more into a pure um, uh, modernist architecture and beginning to leave the more romanticized arts and crafts behind. Here's a historic photo of the factory. Uh, this also fortunately survived the war and has been nicely restored as well. And one of the things I like about this photo is you see in the corner window, you see this open stair that uh, will become quite famous in 
modernist and, and especially Miesian architecture, you see these types of stairs and Mises buildings quite a bit as well. So a little bit about the Bauhaus, uh, as I say, this it's really literally translates into building house. Uh, you could also think of about uh, as design or architecture house uh, as what it is really meant to uh, imply. So I gave you a little bit of the background already. And um, many people began to refer to this new modern architecture coming out of Germany as sort of the Bauhaus style. They associated this design school uh, with, um, with this new design and architecture. And it wasn't really just architecture. There were all different types of um, artistic um, genres coming out of here. Uh, here's the manifesto that Gropius says, you know, forging all forms of art into a single whole to bringing back together all artistic disciplines, sculpture, painting, arts and crafts, manual trades, and making them integral components of a new art of building. And uh, this really emphasizes the idea that uh, even though uh, there, the, the modernists are going to reject the arts and crafts movement and the romantic ideals of it, they don't reject art, they don't reject design, uh, they, they want to integrate all the different aspects of art and design into a whole, uh, and that includes architecture. Uh, but what they don't want to do is trivialize art and, and just apply it randomly to buildings and to architecture. Uh, there was a whole course of study. Uh, you could study architecture, painting, sculpture, uh, um, and uh, various trades like brick lane or stucco. Um, and uh, there, you know, there were I don't know, several hundred students at any given time doing any number of different things. Architecture was only just one small component really of uh, the overall school. Here's a chronology. I won't go through all of these. As I mentioned, it starts in Weimar, moves to Dessau in 1925, and uh, that's an opportunity for Gropius to design a whole new campus complex, uh, which becomes the famous Bauhaus building design, as we'll see. He resigns in 1928. Uh, Mies van der Rohe takes over in 1930 for just a couple of years, actually moves uh, once he's kicked, they're kicked out of Dessau. He moves the school officially to Berlin, uh, but it's really just um, sort of hanging on by a thread and in, in name only because the Nazis have all but shut it down. And uh, uh, Mies himself uh, goes ahead and closes the school and eventually also comes to the United States. So here's an historic photo of the, the, the Dessau building, the Bauhaus. So this is the famous um, expression of the ideals of the modernist movement and one of the very earliest full expressions of this design movement here. So unlike, say, his shoe factory, and you can see some similarities on the, the left, this sort of mass out front that is uh, in this case, stucco and masonry, and then the uh, sort of expressed window wall along the side. Uh, but uh, he's eliminated even the little vestiges of the arts and crafts movement that were still uh, apparent in the shoe factory and certainly in Barron's turbine factory. So there's no longer these horizontal lines. It's just a flat, smooth, monolithic surface of, in this case, stucco, or you know, it could be concrete uh, as, uh, as well in, in later projects as we will see and influenced by Unity Temple. Uh, just simple geometric openings filled with steel windows. And of course, down the side, we get a, an image of the glazed wall that is completely glazed. It's not clad with uh, masonry at all. It's just pure um, steel and glass. We also see there's a number of outbuildings, and in this uh, axonometric drawing of it, uh, it's, it's a campus that's all connected together uh, into different components. And so down here at the bottom, there's a housing area. Uh, this up here is the section we just saw and is where the studios and workshops are. And then there's offices and classrooms in this wing coming over here. And if we look at the floor plan, we see that uh, as well. We see the, the, the portion with the workshops and laboratories, the open spaces down here, the student housing 
over here and then the administration and the uh, classroom space. And the plan is like a pinwheel. It sort of spins around these wings stretching out. And once again, we look at Frank Lloyd Wright and we see that influence that um, his, his planning would have had on these early modernist architects. So this is an aerial view of the Darwin Martin House in Buffalo from 1905. And we see next to it the Vosmuth print uh, in plan. And this was a, a larger complex. So we see the house, the main house down here at the bottom. And then there was a garden walkway or um, uh, passageway that leads to uh, sort of a garage and, and carriage house and a, and a um, greenhouse. And then there's another house, a, um, essentially a guest house over to the side here on the upper right. You can see that over here in the upper right of the photo. And it all sort of stretches out in these different wings. And you can see that sort of planning influence now carried over into the Bauhaus very directly. So here's a few views. Uh, it, the building um, suffered for many, many years, actually. This was, uh, Dessau wound up being in East Germany after World War II, uh, and it was difficult to get to and uh, not well cared for. And of course, it no longer served as a design school after the Nazis closed it down. Uh, so in more recent decades, since the reunification of Germany in the early 1990s, there's been a strong movement to restore the building and reopen uh, the building both for tours but also for um, kind of a school and classes and so forth. It's I wouldn't quite go so far as to say it's a complete re-emergence of a rebirth of the Bauhaus Design School but it's at least being used again uh, for its intended purpose. And so we see that same view that we saw in the historic photograph and we see this monolithic uh, smooth uh, stucco finish with just these uh, simple window, rectangular window openings, and a, a better view along the left of the glazed wall that is nothing but steel and glass. And here's a view of the uh, residential component, and we'll see this um, kind of design aesthetic. We saw it actually a little bit with Adolf Luz and a couple of his buildings uh, from that same era. So you see a little bit of the Luz influence coming out of Vienna. Uh, and we'll see this type of architecture in early works by Mies and by Corbusier here shortly. This is a historic photo of one of the studio spaces. And it's a raw, almost industrial space. There's no you know, fancy ceiling. We just see concrete piers, a concrete slab uh, for a floor and for a ceiling. Uh, some pendant light fixtures hanging down and then lots of light coming in from the glazed curtain wall on the outside. And in fact, you can see pretty clearly here on the right, here's, here's the concrete structural column and the glazed curtain wall is completely independent of that. So this allows uh, to the, the um, Gropius to create a complete full curtain wall that is nothing but steel and glass. He doesn't even have to incorporate structural elements like Barron's did at the turbine factory. Uh, this is uh, the, uh, the office. This was Gropius's office that's been restored. Uh, one of the misconceptions of uh, the international style and German modernism is that it was just black and white. And part of that misconception uh, was spread out actually in, in the contemporary age uh, because photographic images of buildings that were published in magazines and, and periodical you know, publications were black and white photos. And so people didn't see that they were actually quite rich in colors. Uh, Corbusier, especially as we'll see, uh, fully embraced uh, bright, bold colors as we see similar here, the, you know, the chair and the, the walls around it. Uh, so um, it, it, modernism did not necessarily have to be just black and white. Uh, and many Europe, uh, American architects kind of got that impression just from the black and white photos. So I'm just going to give you a quick, uh, some examples of uh, some of the various uh, products that came out of the Bauhaus in the different uh, schools or, or genres that they were working in. This is a graphic design 
uh, promoting, uh, this is actually when it was still in Weimar from 1923, but you can see in graphics, very strong geometries, the bold colors, uh, and devoid of heavy ornamentation, and certainly organic ornamentation that was characteristic of the arts and crafts and Art Nouveau. Marcel Brewer was a very famous uh, both furniture designer and architect uh, that would um, make a pretty strong name for himself uh, in the United States in the, uh, both in the 1930s and after World War II. And this is one of his famous nesting uh, tables, uh, also in bright primary colors, uh, but with very simple um, chrome metal framed uh, and uh, simple design, you know, nothing extraneous, uh, nothing frivolous is in uh, the design here, but they're still visually interesting and well scaled and proportioned and the colors, of course, add a lot of visual interest to them as well. Uh, art and painting were definitely a huge part of the Bauhaus. Uh, Vasily Kandinsky was perhaps the most famous artist to um, work with, uh, with the Bauhaus and emerge out of it. And uh, Mies van der Rohe especially um, was very open about the influence that Kandinsky had on him as an architect. Uh, and in fact, and we might see this later when we talk about the Barcelona Pavilion, but notice how Kandinsky uses these lines that sort of float and slide past one another. And Mies interprets this in an architectural form uh, in planning that we'll see uh, shortly with the Barcelona Pavilion. Uh, photography, uh, Laszlo Mahalinagi, uh, was a very famous um, graphic artist and photographer to emerge out of the Bauhaus and taught there. He also would come to Chicago in the 1930s and create the Institute of Design, which uh, I think at first was affiliated with the School of the Art Institute, but soon uh, was connected to the Illinois Institute of Technology. And Mises um, building Crown Hall, which is primarily serves as the Architecture School at IIT, where Mies also came, uh, also served as the uh, home for the Institute of Design, and uh, which is kind of ironic because Mies and Nagi hated each other. They were kind of rivals to each other, and, and Mies wasn't too happy about having to create space for, um, for the Institute of Design in his uh, architecture building. Uh, there's, there's actually a story that he, that he stuffed them down in the basement uh, which, which isn't really quite true. Um, it's more myth and, than, than reality in that, yes, they were in the basement. That's because uh, they needed, uh, they didn't want the big open windows that the drafting studios got on the upper floor. They needed more enclosed spaces for dark rooms and things like that. Uh, fabric arts also were a significant part. This is by Elsie Moglen, I think it's how you pronounce her name, uh, a, a weaving. Uh, women were actually a pretty significant, played a pretty significant role at the Bauhaus as mostly as students and at times as instructors as well. Um, there was a, a much more embrace or openness to women being in uh, in the arts and in the modernist movement, um, still with limitations that come with the you know, limitations that women still faced and discrimination that they still faced in the 1920s uh, and through much of the early part of the 1900s. But uh, there, was, there was definitely a much more openness to uh, sort of progressive ideals, which includes feminism. And we, we definitely see quite a few um, talented uh, women designers emerge out of the Bauhaus as well. Uh, so this is a fun little historic photo uh, in their free time. Uh, they, the, the Bauhaus students, they like to party. And this is a photograph of a costume ball in which uh, all the participants had to uh, create their own costume. And uh, this is almost like a little atomic space age, some of these things. Um, and you can see quite a few women uh, were participating in this as well. Uh, pretty, pretty funky. There was a um, I didn't include a photo, but there was a, a design exhibit at the Elmhurst Art Museum uh, last year, uh, and they had a couple of the costumes. None of them are the ones that show up in this photo, 
uh, but they're they're pretty funky little costumes that look like they're right out of the 1950s uh, space movies that uh, Martians or something were attacking America. Okay, so uh, the other uh, great architect to come out of um, Peter Barron's office and an early proponent and founder of the modernist movement is Le Corbusier. Here he is with one of his greatest works that I'll be showing you, which is Via Savoy. Corbusier actually is a, uh, and nicknamed Corbu, uh, is actually uh, a nickname of his full name, Charles Edouard Genere. Uh, he was a uh, French Swiss. Uh, the, the border between France and Switzerland is a little bit nebulous, and uh, he, he, I think he was born on the Swiss side of the border, but uh, in a region that uh, spoke French, and he always sort of associated himself more with France and, and lived for most of his career and life in Paris. Uh, he was trained as a painter initially uh, and kind of came to architecture a little bit later. He worked for a famous French uh, Parisian architect, Auguste Perret, who uh, was uh, sort of a pioneer in concrete architecture. So doing concrete buildings about the same time that Frank Lloyd Wright was doing concrete buildings like Unity Temple. And uh, really learned the, the techniques of concrete actually much better than Frank Lloyd Wright ever did, uh, who never quite mastered the the technical aspects of it uh, and became um, really uh, focused most of his work uh, in concrete. Uh, he also worked for time, as I mentioned, for Peter Behrens, and it was there that he was exposed more to the, the modernist and industrial design that similar to what we saw at the turbine factory. And so these different influences uh, kind of came together and created a, almost a unique architectural expression uh, that Kobu had. He was also very fascinated, as I'll show you in a minute, with the concrete grain elevators of the Midwest. And in one of his uh, books on architecture, he showed examples of these grain elevators. And I'll show you uh, how that fits into his architecture in a few moments. So initially, uh, his, ironically, his most famous work isn't an actual building. It's, it's more of a, a theory or philosophy on what a house should be. And it's, it's called the Domino House. Uh, and it dates from 1914. And uh, as you can see, it's not really a full-fledged house with walls and bathrooms and bedrooms and so forth in it. It's more of a conceptual idea uh, of what a house framework ought to be. And uh, he, he really felt that initially there should be uh, a structural system that was independent of everything else, of the exterior walls, of the interior walls, of the space, uh, that you create a grid of structure and, and that, that the house then forms in and around that. He also believed that uh, you should lift the house up off the ground. And you can see in the Domino house, there are these little sort of foundation piers that he sets it on. And he shows, you know, a circulation space that is almost sculptural, which we'll see uh, in short order. And also flat slabs, uh, both floor slabs, of course, but even the roof can just be a simple flat slab supported by the structural frame. And that allows one to take advantage of a roof structure uh, in ways that a pitched roof, uh, you cannot. So out of this Domino house, uh, Corbusier uh, creates what he called his five points of architecture. And this, these are very important um, philosophies that carry through, not just for Corbusier, but you'll see in many other modernist works. Uh, they might not always embrace all of them, but the, the overall philosophy pretty much holds for most of the uh, early international style projects. And so number one uh, is what Kobu called pilotis. Uh, this is that the building should be raised up off the ground on columns. Here in the Domino house, there's squat little piers. We'll see uh, much more um, pin, you know, uh, column-like uh, pilotis uh, in, in a moment. Uh, number two is roof gardens. Uh, so if you have a flat roof, 
that is a space you can now take advantage of. And to Carbu, the way to take advantage of it is to create a roof garden up there or a roof space. And this is a way to create uh, outdoor space, uh, especially for people living in an urban environment. You know, if Frank Lloyd Wright wanted to break down the barrier between man and nature and have a connection to nature with his sprawling garden walls, uh, he could do that in theory in the, in the Great Plains of the American Midwest. But in uh, an urban setting in Europe, which is much more common, um, Corbu saw the opportunity to create a garden natural space outdoors for fresh air and, and communion with nature with this flat roof garden. So that's number two. Number three are partitions. Uh, these are literally the interior walls, and they would be completely independent of the structural system. So here in the Domino House, we don't see any partitions, but they could be anywhere. They can, they can be completely um, in any pattern and form that one needs in order to create the interior spaces that are necessary for the building or for the house. And you, they don't need to be load-bearing partitions. They don't have to be in a particular place so they can hold up the second floor or something like that. They're, they can be t torn down, moved around, almost like the, the Japanese soji screens. Again, something that Frank Lloyd Wright uh, fully embraced uh, and not necessarily be movable, although we'll see some examples where they can be, uh, but they could at least be placed however you needed them. So number four are horizontal windows. Uh, again, this is not something we see in the Domi No House, but with an exterior that is also independent, and we'll see number five facade, uh, an independent free floating curtain wall facade uh, that does not have to be tied in any way to the structural system will allow for uh, item four, which is these horizontal windows, these ribbons or bands of windows that can flood the interior with light. They don't have to be uh, centered or moved about in particular ways or places. They, you know, the walls and the interior spaces can almost form to the ribbons of windows on the outside. So these five points are uh, often followed by Corbusier in his architecture, and as I say, uh, mostly followed by many of the other early international style architects. So uh, the project that best exemplifies the five points for Kubu is the Via Savoy. This is in Poissy, France. This is just outside of Paris and sits up on top of a hill overlooking the Seine River Valley. Uh, and it was uh, built in 1928 and finished in 1931. This was a weekend house. The uh, Savoy family was quite wealthy and lived in Paris, but they wanted to get out of the city and have a nice country house uh, to go to on weekends and in summers and so forth. And so, um, uh, the, you know, Corbu had the opportunity here to create something a little more imaginative and uh, didn't have to be 100% functional for normal daily living. So here we see one of the most famous views of it. This would be uh, technically from the back side of the house, uh, although there really isn't much of a front or back. The, uh, the bluffs or the, the valley is, is uh, off to the left. So if you're standing looking out these ribbons of windows, uh, you would be looking uh, mostly out towards the river valley. But so we see the five points here. Uh, pretty, pretty clearly expressed just in this one photograph. So first we see the pilotis, these columns that rise the main living level, what the French call the premier etage, what we call the second floor, that is lifted up off the ground and allows this openness underneath. And you just have a solid core, in this case, as we'll see, for the entry uh, for some servant spaces and for the garage, car uh, automobile garage. Uh, we see on the top, the roof garden, uh, can't quite fully see it here, but you can see that this element here looks like some sort of sculptural element for a roof garden. We can actually see through this ribbon of window into an open area that appears to be a, a, a roof garden as well. The facade is you know, completely independent of the structure, and you can see that very well here in the 
uh, roof garden opening on the right where the columns come through this is the structure and the wall is just a surface you know keeping out the the weather and the elements and then the bands of ribbon windows are you know stretched all the way across the facade here and you can sort of make out that the interior spaces uh, can just be freely applied and that it doesn't really matter with the ribbon windows. The two don't have to coordinate, certainly not in the way that, say, Beaux-Arts architecture, interior, exterior, uh, you know, had this sort of union of space. You can almost, quote, read a building um, exterior you can read how the space inside is arranged and configured just by looking at the fenestration pattern from the exterior well that doesn't really apply here at uh, via savoy it's just one big band of windows and the interior could be just about anything so here's a floor plan on the left is the ground floor and we see the little dots these are the pilotis and that is actually a grid that carries across all the way here. And so the partition walls, even on the ground floor, are completely independent. So they can be a completely curved partition. You see the auto garage. This is the entry here, uh, main entry here, and it leads to a stair and to the ramp leading to the main living level, which is here on the sort of middle. And in the plan, we see a big open room here. This is the main sort of living space. Uh, he doesn't break it down into lots of tiny little rooms. Uh, he keeps just one big open living space. There's some bedrooms off to the side and then this big courtyard garden area uh, takes up a huge amount of space as well. And then on the far right you, you can see the upper roof garden uh, which we'll see in a moment. The section is interesting too as well. You can see this ramp that carries a circulation pattern all the way through and becomes a sculptural element much like we saw at the Domino House uh, as well as a functional um, circulation space. So here's another view of the exterior. This would be the view that you would see as you were approaching the house um, and uh, actually the driveway goes up underneath. You can kind of see here on the right goes underneath and between the piloti and the chauffeur, because they were a wealthy family, the chauffeur would pull up into the front door and drop you off and you would be under this overhang of the building above you. And so getting in and out of the car, you wouldn't get wet. You did get wet inside. The uh, building leaked pretty badly uh, and the Savoys were always very unhappy with Kubu over that. He never could solve the uh, leaking parts of the uh, roof and walls. Uh, so here is uh, the view as you would pull up in your automobile uh, driven by your chauffeur and the front door on the left here is this black opening and you can see it's a very simple unadorned door. Um, this is very characteristic of the international style. There's no, you know, classical pediment or portico. There's no um, angels and putti floating around to sort of delineate the entrance. It's rather sort of uh, restrained and simple, which is the way modernist architects wanted it. And a view of the interior uh, showing the spiral staircase and a view from the ramp with the spiral staircase as you come up to the second floor. Um, it, it, I'm not the biggest fan personally of Corbu's architecture in many ways. I have a lot of criticisms of certain aspects of it, but it's very sculptural and it's, you can see the sort of almost art, artist in Corbu come out in these sculptural forms in his buildings, even if his space planning uh, left a lot to be desired. Uh, a few more views of some of the, what I'm talking about, the sculptural form of that ramp that uh, zigzags up through the building. And on the right, you see this main level courtyard uh, and the, the ramp is fully expressed. It's sculptural and beautiful in many ways, uh, but it is an, a pure, honest expression of the function that is happening there, uh, which is also something very important in modernist architecture. And as you keep going up the ramp, you get to the upper uh, garden level at the very top. Um, it's, it's a little bit odd. This is one of the criticisms I have of Corbu. Uh, here we have this rooftop deck, 
with a what is supposed to be this great view of the Seine River Valley, and he puts a wall blocking almost all of the view, and all you get is this little picture window, uh, and that's the the view that they'll have of the valley. It was never quite clear on why he wanted to do that exactly. So here, uh, standing in the main level uh, courtyard, looking into the sort of main living space, and here we see. Uh, really breaking down that wall. If Frank Lloyd Wyatt Wright wanted to have a wall of windows uh, with the modern technologies of plate glass and steel frames in the 1920s, here you can do that. You can literally have a wall of glass. This is something that in the early 1900s you couldn't quite do yet. Uh, and so, um, and and this actually opens up. This, this whole pane here is a sliding window that will slide open and fully unite the interior and the exterior, which is perfect uh, in, a, in a country house when you want to get away in the nice weather and, and enjoy some fresh air. Here's a view of the interior living space. Uh, this, there's a lot of white in this building, but uh, Corbu does add a little bit of color here with that salmon colored wall down on the end. Uh, we see how the structure is completely independent of the walls on this column on the left, completely independent of the glazed wall to that, and even the column on the right, this one right here, which is the structural column, is completely independent of the wall with the ribbon window, and then there's just a simple flue uh, for the uh, fireplace there. Uh, here's a view looking down on the left is looking down a hallway towards the bedroom wing. This is another criticism I have of Corbu. Very narrow spaces, uh, very oddly proportioned, but at least he's got a little skylight at the end of the hallway that sort of gives you a, a light to be drawn towards. On the right is um, uh, the, the master bath in this beautiful blue tile and then one of his famous chaise lounges uh, built in with the tile so you can uh, relax and, and enjoy a, a lounging bath, uh, plunging in and out uh, on a lazy Sunday morning, I guess. Uh, the next project I want to tell you is a little bit late in his career um, and it actually occurs after World War II, but is pretty representative and shows the continuation and evolution of Corbus' design philosophy. This is from 1947, the Unité d'Habitation uh, in Marseille, France. Uh, and he does unites uh, throughout uh, Europe. There's some in Paris, there's actually some in Berlin, uh, and, but the first and most famous is in Marseille, uh, a major industrial city on the south coast of France. And here is a, right, here is a historic photo. Uh, soon after it was constructed, there's not much of anything around it. Uh, Corbu really uh, envisioned these towers to be built almost in park-like settings with trees and, and uh, natural landscapes around them that people could look out and enjoy or, or walk out of their apartment block and enjoy around them. We'll see an example of that in a moment. Uh, but it's all in uh, cast concrete. Uh, we do see the pilotis, uh, a little bit different form than we just saw at uh, Via Savoy. These are more slabs, but they are the same. They're doing the same thing. They're essentially acting as pilotis. And uh, up on the top, there is a flat roof where we're going to see a roof garden in a moment. And I want to show you this photos here of grain elevators to show you the influence that these had on Corbu and especially on the unites. Uh, obviously, he didn't want to mimic them. That's you know he he appreciated the the honesty of form and structure of a grain elevator because that is what was necessary to build them. Uh, he he wasn't going to recreate that form for a housing block, but you can see the repetitive nature of the vertical elements uh, that are apparent in the grain elevators and the, the full embrace of concrete, which he really appreciated as well. Uh, here's a great example of me of Carbu introducing color into his buildings. You can see all the bright primary colors uh, painted on the sort of uh, inset walls uh, for little uh, balconies that people have in their apartments. Here's one of the roof decks. So uh, having a flat roof, you have a roof garden. This is an amenity for the residents. It's a place where they can come up, they can 
have a swim and they can, you know, there's lounge about and enjoy some fresh air and so forth. So uh, this to him, this is important that, you know, people living in a dense urban environment do need uh, uh, to have a connection to nature. They do need a, an opportunity for fresh air and the roof garden, one of his five points, is a way to do that. You can also see some of the beautiful sculptural forms he creates. This is, you know, uh, essentially an exhaust vent for the building uh, and uh, almost in a Gaudi-like uh, approach to creating a very uh, imaginative sculptural element. Uh, the planning for it is also pretty innovative. Uh, the, the units, rather than being uh, just on each floor, they're actually duplexes of units. And in the section, you can see the white in the middle is the, the corridor passageway, the common corridor. And so you, you would enter into a vestibule on one level and uh, there'd be living space and the living space down below and bedrooms uh, down on the other side. This gave people uh, windows and vista on two different directions. Uh, and it also was a very efficient planning system because if you look at the upper one with the yellow as being the common corridor, um, for every three floors, you only need one common corridor. And a building can't get rent right from common space that only from space the apartment units that they can rent and so uh, this this plan not only serves uh, some benefit to the residents but it also is a much more efficient and practical way to to build a building and you know the modernist architects are often really uh, interested in how can we build buildings efficiently and and effectively this is the idea of you know of taking industrial processes and applying that to architecture. So that's a good example of how Corbu does that. Here's a view of the concrete pilotis um, done in what he called the beton brut, uh, which is just raw concrete. Uh, it's made somewhat interesting visually by the board forms uh, that uh, you see in the, almost a checkerboard or parquet-like pattern. Uh, this would later be uh, used quite a bit in the post-war period and, and got the name brutalist architecture uh, from, from that French term beton brut, and it's kind of an unfortunate name for architecture because it uh, uh, sort of connotes an idea of it's a kind of a brutal uh, uh, aesthetic, which many people actually think it is a natural looking architecture. Corbu uh, also experimented with uh, almost the idea of um, Leonardo da Vinci's uh, uh, universal man uh, and the scale and proportions of, of people and how that should impact architecture. Um, so we see an example here that he uh, created the, the, the various proportions of in this case, a man, which um, uh, has a different proportions and scales than the woman does. Here's uh, a neat photo of somebody standing next to an imprint at one of the unites. And uh, it's, it's an interesting philosophy. In the end, it didn't work very well. So many of his spaces are really oddly proportioned. He, he creates this set of rules for himself that he follows strictly, and the rules don't always work. And that's one difference between Corbu and, and Mies van der Rohe, who often admitted freely that um, he would break his own rules if, if it was necessary to create a better scale or proportion or just to make something right and feel right. Um, Mies was much more in tune with, um, with human scale and proportion, actually, than Corbu ever was. The last thing I want to show you for Corbu uh, is his Plan Vaucine. Uh, for Paris. This was a design scheme from 1925, uh, and it was just a theoretical concept. I, I don't think he was ever very serious about this, but his plan was to address the urban slum tenement housing problem that all major cities were facing, and including Paris. Uh, his proposal, well, what if we were just to eliminate all of that and create these shiny new towers in open garden, sun-filled uh, spaces. And uh, it, it, it didn't take on. I mean, it was ridiculed, of course, uh, by Parisians who said, how dare you propose tearing down most of Paris? Uh, but unfortunately, um, well, World War II 
did the demolition for much of Europe uh, and in the in the United States uh, we we embraced urban renewal uh, and essentially the plan Rossine scheme that that um, Kubru had created in the 1920s. This is a model he created, and you see the Seine River down here with uh, the Ile de la Cité. Uh, I don't think he proposed tearing down uh, Notre Dame, which would be right about here. Uh, and here's the Louvre Palace and Tuileries Gardens over here on the right bank. But he did propose taking out this whole section of the right bank of Paris and replacing it with this uh, city in a garden. Uh, with these towers uh, spaced out uh, with gardens and landscape all around them. And it sounded, this is part of this idealistic idea of modernist architecture. We could solve these social problems of urban slums and tenement housing with great architecture. And as we'll see uh, in a future lecture, we actually try doing this, and it turns out it doesn't work so well. <laughs>